It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Rusty Schweikart, who uh, was an Apollo 9 astronaut, the first lunar module pilot on the mission. Uh, he co-founded the B612 Foundation, one of our co-sponsors for today, along with Ed Liu, whom you'll hear from uh, later uh, today, and served as its chairman until 2011. He's the founder of the Association of Space Explorers and served as president of that organization as well. Should note, he's also a fellow of uh, the Academy, and uh, that's a group of people who help guide the scientific mission of our institution. And important for what we're talking about today, he also founded and chaired the ASE, uh, the Association of Space Explorers Near Earth Object Committee, with its International Panel on Asteroid Th Threat Mitigation, and he produced and submitted to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, the seminal report, Asteroid Threats, A Call for Global Response. So please welcome Rusty Schweikart. I need, I need the, oh, okay. Good morning. Okay, so at the beginning of the day here, we decided, um, well, we'll get into the details later, but my job is to give Asteroids 101, that is all of the basics. What is an asteroid? You know, where are they? You, you've already had time to read it. So let's just jump into it. We'll have a little bit of time for Q&A, I hope. Okay, so when did it all begin? Four and a half billion years ago. And I want the kids to think about how big that number is. Oops, it went too far. <laughs> okay, four and a half billion years is 4,500 million. Okay, so that's a long, long time ago. And that, that was when the solar system started with the, uh, not yet the sun, but what became the sun in the middle, and around it, gas and dust. And of course, after a short time, uh, the sun got together a bit more, and that gas and dust turned into you know, crystals of stuff, and then pebbles, and the pebbles got together and formed rocks. The rocks get together and form boulders. And out of all of that swirling stuff, uh, we end up in the end with planets going around the, the sun. Uh, and of course, the biggest one being Jupiter. Oop, whoa. <laughs> we just jumped three ahead here, okay. Um, so I'll use, it seems to be jumping back and forth, Ryan. I don't know why, let's try again. Okay, so we started with the gas and dust and then we got pebbles and then we got planets. Okay, and um, we have Jupiter out here, the big red circle on the outside and Mars is inside all those yellow ones. That yellow band, as Ryan showed a while ago, is where the asteroids uh, ended up in the main belt of asteroids. They never quite got together to form a planet in there, although they sort of should have, but they didn't. And partly because Jupiter is so big and the gravity of Jupiter kept those rocks from getting together to form a planet. And in fact, uh, Jupiter not only, hmm, okay. <laughs> Okay, we're not quite tracking here. Let's see if we can do it again. Okay, so Jupiter is a really big planet and not only did it keep the asteroids uh, from forming a, a planet, but in fact, the gravity of Jupiter is so strong that it occasionally kicks uh, asteroids out of the main belt and some of them get thrown out of the solar system altogether but a lot of them end up also coming into the inner solar system and crossing the orbit of the Earth. And you can see here the green dots are the actual, uh, the main belt of asteroids and you can't really see the planet's orbits there, but Mars's orbit is just outside that red group. The red group are asteroids that Jupiter has kicked out of the main belt and they come in and cross the Earth's orbit. And of course, as they cross the Earth's orbit, there's always a chance that they can hit the Earth. We call those near-Earth asteroids 
And those are the ones that we're really concerned with. The green ones, there are billions of them. The red ones, there are millions that are large enough to cause damage on the surface of the Earth when they hit the Earth. A lot of them are small to the point where they don't do any damage at all. We call them shooting stars. They come in every night, 100 tons of stuff. But as they get bigger, uh, they can hurt when they hit the Earth, and those are the ones we're interested in. But this is sort of a snapshot, a better way to look at it. Hmm. Want to give me one click there, uh, Ian? Okay, there we go. That's a better way to look at it. Uh, because you see that each of those individual dots is actually on an orbit. And so here you can see the orbits of these things as they cross the orbits of Mars and the Earth in particular and Venus, etc. So it's the fact that these asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, do not orbit the Earth. They orbit the Sun. One of the fundamental things you need to, to, to get used to is that we're not talking about things that orbit the Earth. These guys are neighbors in orbiting the sun. They're just like planets, except that they're in eccentric orbits, that, and the ones that cross the Earth's orbit are the ones that we're concerned with. Okay, and the reason we're concerned is because as they cross the Earth's orbit, they occasionally hit the Earth, the moon, everything else. This is the moon, and because it has no atmosphere, that's what the surface looks like when those asteroids hit, hit the moon. The Earth's surface would look like that as well, except for the fact that we have weather and rain and volcanoes and oceans and you know all kinds of things that erase all the craters. But the Earth has been hit more times than the Moon. The difference is primarily that the atmosphere around the Earth protects us, but also the big ones that hit, we don't see much of anymore because of erosion and the resurfacing of the Earth but they nevertheless hit us. And of course the moon looks like, okay, the next one if it comes up shows you the whole moon, there we go. And uh, you can see the whole moon is just filled with craters. In fact, craters on top of craters on top of craters. So that's evidence that in fact, for four and a half billion years, this has been going on and the thing that people don't recognize and that you need to understand is it's still going on. It's not that this happened in the past and stopped. We're still in this process. It's going on continuously. The difference is that a big one hits only maybe once in our lifetime so that we don't recognize that it is still happening, but it is. Okay, so uh, how big are these asteroids? Well. I got a picture here that shows you the Earth's moon in the lower right and then Pluto and we got a spacecraft that's just about to visit Pluto, the New Horizons, uh, just in the next few weeks. And then the biggest asteroid, Ceres, and the second biggest, Vesta, and you already saw a picture of, of uh, Vesta earlier this morning. So let's just look at the Vesta, the second biggest and the ones, the smaller ones to the upper left. Okay, so <laughs> can I go back one? Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Now forward one, thanks. Okay, so now Vesta is in the middle there. And um, I don't know if you can see my green dot or not, but there's Vesta. And then as you come down here, these are the smaller ones um, in the main belt. And the, the biggest near Earth asteroid, the biggest one that crosses the Earth's orbit, is this one here, which is Eros, and then they get smaller yet. And in this, in this lighting, you can't see it, but way down at the bottom is a very, very, it just shows up as a dot, and that one, we have a picture of, let me try to turn this on again. Okay, I think it just switched off on me. Okay, so that's Itakawa. And Itakawa, this is an actual picture taken by the Japanese space agency who went out and visited uh, this asteroid uh, back about 10 years ago. This one is about, I'll show you the size, uh, it looks like this next to a familiar landmark. There we go. Okay, there's a pretty familiar landmark. 
And that's Itakawa to scale uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, so it's about, um, you know, a third of a mile um, in size or something like that. Um, but let me show you what happens now. Uh, asteroids that large are pretty dangerous if they hit the Earth. There are about 10,000 of them. But let, let, let's just talk about how big does an asteroid have to be to really do damage? Well, let's start at the really big end. Almost everybody knows about the asteroid, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the asteroid, the dinosaurs being wiped out by an asteroid impact. Well, the size, if I took Itakawa and scale it up with regard to San Francisco, it would have to be about that big. That is, it would be about seven or eight miles from one end to the other. It would cross, it would be bigger than the, 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 from the ocean to the bay, okay? And when that hits, an, an object that big, that really creates uh, problems for everything that lives all around the planet. You don't have just a problem with San Francisco. In fact, San Francisco just gets vaporized if it hit there. Um, that, that asteroid uh, was about seven miles in diameter, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. The interesting thing is that when an asteroid like that hits the Earth, it's coming so fast that it actually ends up being about three times deeper than its diameter before it explodes and blows out a huge hole in the Earth. So that asteroid at about seven miles across would have gone down, if it hit here, it would have gone down about 20 miles below the surface under San Francisco and then blown everything in a big cone out, most of it back up into space, but not escape velocity. It would have come down, vapor, rocks, boulders, all around the planet and block out sunlight and set everything on fire and that's what kills the dinosaurs, the fact that no sunlight gets to the surface of the Earth when something that big hits. But luckily, that, that, the last one of those happened 66 million years ago, and we probably got hit in the four and a half billion years that we existed, maybe 40 times, but the only one we have in recorded history, or sort of recorded history, is 66 million years ago the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. So we know where all these guys are. There are only about maybe 10 of them in the, uh, going around in the solar system today. We know where they are and none of them are gonna hit the Earth. But if I go down a little bit smaller, let's go to the actual size of Itakawa. Okay, I've got an arrow up there and you can see this is the, oops, there's the actual size of Itakawa. Again, it's about a third the, so the length of the Golden Gate Bridge. So if that, the actual Itakawa hit right in the middle of San Francisco, uh, there are about 10,000 of those that, cr that cross the Earth's orbit, and we know where about 40% of them are, but about 60% we haven't found yet. So we've, we've got some work to do to find the population of these guys. But if that one hit in the middle of San Francisco, it would basically wipe out everything from about uh, San Jose, maybe up to Santa Rosa. So it would just wipe it out. Everything would be destroyed. So these things are really, really very powerful. But if we go to things which are far, that only happens about once every 300,000 years or so. So again, it's not something to worry about. They're out there and we want to stop them, but uh, I wouldn't worry about it happening in your lifetime. But if we come down to things which are a little more human scale, okay, the, the one that we're celebrating today in a way, the Tunguska impact, 100, uh, about 107 years ago, hit in Russia or Siberia in 1908, it was about the size of that big one there. It's about 40 meters in diameter and you can see the shadow on the football field, give you an idea. Think about maybe eight four-bedroom houses in a ball, okay? That's about how big you're talking about. And that ha one of those hits about once every 500 years. And we'll show you what the result will be, but it could wipe out everybody in a city if it hit over a city. 
The smaller one here is um, uh, what we call the Chelyabinsk, Chelyabinsk size. That's the size of the one that hit three years ago, excuse me, two years ago in Russia. And I'll show you a little more of that in a second. But that one is about the size of a four bedroom house, okay? And one of those hits about once every 50 years. So for everybody in the room here, you know, you might see one or two of those hit the earth during your lifetime. In terms of the bigger one, the Tunguska size, there's about a 20% chance that during your lifetime, one of those is gonna hit the earth, okay? Unless we know it's ahead of time and we stop it from hitting. At least we can warn people if we know about it ahead of time. Now the problem is that we only know there, there are about a million of the ones, the Tunguska size, and we know about 1% of them. So 99% of them we haven't found yet. The, the odds are if one of them hit, it would be a total surprise. We wouldn't know about it ahead of time unless we do some more work, and that's what the 100X declaration is about. We need to step up our game to find the rest of them. And the ones that are the small size, the Chelyabins, there are about 10 million of those that cross the Earth's orbit, and we know about a tenth of 1% of those. We know almost none of those, and those are gonna be very hard to find. Okay, so let me go on. So that gives you an idea of the kind of damage that can be done. This is the one that hit the smallest one that I just showed, the Chelyabinsk object, and this was a film from uh, Russia two years ago, 9.30 in the morning. This thing appeared in the sky, this streak in the sky, and the 15th of February, 2013. And people took pictures of this thing. They said, wow, what's that? And nobody knew quite what it was. Maybe it's a satellite entering. But people were taking pictures, and I don't know if we have sound or not. Those are some Russians talking. Okay, and you can see what happened. It blew the camera out of his hand. Here's some video ca you know, cameras in offices and things. And there's a bunch of guys who saw the flash and they said, what was that? And they're headed out to look to see what that was. Right. Yeah, so the Chelyabinsk object uh, was about, for those who know about that, it was about 30 times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb that was dropped on Japan. Uh, this number is wrong now, it's a little bit old. We know about 12,700 as of this morning, uh, but there are about a million of them out there that are large enough that if they hit like the Chelyabinsk object did near a city, they would basically wipe it out. And I'll show you that. I, I, I like to show this picture because a lot of people keep thinking about this sort of being academic, you know? And I wanted to show what happened in Chelyabinsk. Nobody was killed, that's the good news. But 1,500 people ended up with cuts and bruises and windows broken and all sorts of things because of it. This is, these things are real and what we're trying to do with planetary defense is to know about these things ahead of time so as a minimum, we can evacuate people or give them instructions so that they don't get cut by flying glass. And at best, if we know about them ahead of time, we can actually prevent them from hitting. Okay, so we're about to be done here. Okay, so the Tunguska, the larger one uh, of the ones over the football field, this is sort of a graph, an, an, an artist's conception in the upper left of that morning, 9.30 in the morning, again in Siberia for some weird reason, uh, came in and exploded. And that one on the lower left, you can see all the trees that are blown down. Luckily, again, we think no one was killed in that, but only because there's nobody out there. It actually destroyed about 800 square miles of the forest. And if it had been a city instead of the forest, here is a picture 
of London. Oop, back now. <laughs> Keep going. There we go. Okay, so now you see a map of London and that 800 square mile outline that was destroyed superposed on London. And you can see that everything in London or any other city that you put in that footprint would have been destroyed. And again, there are about a million of those objects out there. And we know we're tracking right now only about 1%. So we got to find the other 99% of the things that can wipe out a city if they hit over it. Now, let me emphasize that if the Earth gets hit once every 500 years, cities are not, don't cover the whole Earth. So a city would only be hit maybe once every 200,000 years. But nevertheless, we don't, you don't know that. And if one's coming in, you want to stop it from hitting the Earth because you're never sure whether or not it's going to hit a city. Okay, so how do we find them? We use telescopes. But these guys are very, very dim. You know, when you look at planets and the moon and things like that, you're looking at reflected sunlight, sunlight bouncing off these objects in space. But asteroids are about the color of a charcoal briquette. So you're getting very, very little light. The result is you can only see them by and large when they're very close to the Earth. So we try to find them as they go by the Earth all the time and figure out their orbits, but it's very difficult with optical telescopes. If, so what we really are interested in is getting a telescope in space that doesn't look at reflected light from the sun, but looks at the temperature, looks at the heat radiated from these. You can picture a charcoal briquette sitting out in the sun gets pretty hot. So they show up very bright in the infrared, and that's why we're interested in getting an infrared telescope into space in order to help find the asteroids that we don't know yet. And this is one telescope. This is one proposed by our foundation, B612 Foundation, and there's another one that NASA is looking at called NEOCAM. But what main thing, we need to get a, an infrared telescope out there in space. So uh, how does an asteroid impact the Earth? I don't know if you can see this picture, but the circular uh, tracks there are Mercury near, nearest the Sun, and then Venus and Earth, and you can see Mars on the outer circle. But you can see the blue ellipse that crosses the Earth's orbit in two different places. And the, and the crossing at the bottom is one where it's a three-dimensional crossing. It's not just a two-dimensional, but it's a crossing and intersection in three dimensions. And you know the Earth goes through that intersection once a year, the asteroid goes around, and the question is when the Earth is in the intersection, which is only about eight minutes every year, okay, during that eight minutes, does the, does the asteroid come through at the same time? If you do, that's an impact. So that's how they impact the Earth, and what we need to do is to either speed them up or slow them down so that they miss that, that eight minute period. That's how you deflect an asteroid. So, and you're gonna hear more about that later. But just to summarize, how often do we get hit, which is what people are interested in? Every day, about 100 tons of asteroids hit the Earth. But they're the size of sand grains, or maybe little pebbles. And so they just burn up in the atmosphere, and we look up at night, and we call them shooting stars. But those are all itty-bitty asteroids, you know? So we get hit all the time, continuously, but the smaller they are, the more numerous they are. The bigger they are, the fewer and far between. So each night, about 100 tons of material comes into the Earth. Uh, each year, about two asteroids the size of a car hit the Earth, and they make a pretty bright flash, but they still don't do any damage on the ground. About every 10 years, an asteroid the size of a two-bedroom house hits the Earth. And again, that still doesn't do any damage on the ground, but that's a really, really bright uh, asteroid when it comes through the atmosphere. But from here on now, every 50 years, about once every 50 years, we get hit by one like the one that hit Russia two years ago about the size of a four-bedroom house. Um, and so th that's going to happen probably again in the lifetime of mo many of you. 
Again, those are going to be pretty hard to find all of them. There are 10 million of those guys. Okay? But the ones that we care about the most are the ones that are the Tunguska size, the so-called city killers, about uh, 440 meters in diameter, or 150, meter, 150 feet in diameter. And one of those hits about every 500 years. And those are the ones that we want to make sure we find. We only know about 1%. We've got to get the other 99% with our telescopes. But those we can forecast, we can evacuate a city, or if we have enough information, we can go up ahead of time and deflect them, stop them from hitting. So we can literally, with our space technology today, prevent asteroids from hitting the Earth if we know that they're coming. But the number one thing we got to do is find them first. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and I don't know if we have any time for Q&A. Okay. So, one, yes, sir. I'm really not, I, I apologize, uh, but the room is bad and my ears are worse, so I have a hard time hearing you. He's asking about Chernobyl. About Chernobyl? After Chernobyl, a group of high ranking Russian officials walked straight in. Okay, but that, what does that have to do with asteroids, sir? Uh, uh, the, that was a nuclear accident with a nuclear power plant. Chelyabinsk, yeah. Chely Chelyabinsk, uh, there's no radiation connected. Uh, this is not like a nuclear accident where you have radiation. Uh, Chelyabinsk, uh, w when one of these asteroids comes in and explodes, it's very, very bright. The one that came in over Russia two years ago, when it flashed, it was about eight times as bright as the sun. Bright daylight, it was making shadows. And a few people got sunburned from it, got, got skin burns and peeled from being near that. So it's pretty bright, but there's no radiation there. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you, Rusty.